Okay, so we are in Luke chapter 7 today, and as we look at a couple stories that are kind of unique stories in Scripture, uh, stories of healings, um, and, and every time you get to a story like this, we want to ask the question when we're reading through Scripture is, why are the stories that are in the Bible, why are they in the Bible? Because if you think about it, Jesus lived on earth for 30 plus years, 35 years maybe, and his public ministry lasted for, we know, about three years, but we certainly don't have every story about Jesus. In fact, in the book of John, he ends and says, if, if we wrote everything that God has done in people's lives, there wouldn't be enough paper on earth to write it down. And, and so we know that the life of the way God interacts with people is in all these different ways throughout history. So when we read stories in scripture, we want to read with the this question on our mind that says, why is this story included? And, and today we're going to look at two different stories of healings. And anytime you get to those, you want to ask, like, well, are these the only people that Jesus has ever healed, the ones that are recorded? And it stands to reason, in fact, we, it's alluded to that there are many others who were healed. So why was their story told? The other thing that we ask is, well, what are the stories that were never told that because there wasn't a story? There's many people that Jesus didn't heal. And so today, we're going to look at those stories, and, and, but we want to look at them with, why is this included, and what does it tell us about who God is? Now, anytime you get to these stories in Scripture that kind of have the miraculous, every time there's miraculous things in there, it's because God is, at that moment, trying to communicate something particular to a group or to an individual. And so not everybody, as they went through their lives, experienced miracles every day and all the time. It even stands to reason that you're hanging out with Jesus for three years. There might have been some days at the end of the day, the disciples looked at Jesus and said, seriously, nothing else? You're not going to do anything today? We just went fishing and hung out? I mean, Jesus, come on, how about a miracle at the end of the day? But it stands to reason that they had some normal days. And, and so when we look at this, we want to say, well, why does God sometimes, in the course of human history, break in? with something that's miraculous. Now, let me um, make one more mention before we get to these stories. Some of you might hear that and say, well, these are just myths, and we can't really believe when there's stories of miracles. And, and, and I understand coming with a, a little bit of skepticism as we look at them. But I want to also say, and we don't have time to get into it today, but we believe that there's a logical and, and theological reason for believing that Jesus was God in flesh and walked among us. It's very consistent with this narrative of scripture and history and all kinds of things that kind of go together that cause us to say, we believe there's a reasonable expectation that Jesus was the son of God who lived and breathed among us. And if Jesus was God in flesh, then I'm okay. If I can believe that, I'm okay believing the miraculous happened around him. And to know that there are times when this was not necessarily the norm of how God interacted with all humans, but at times he did for a reason. So we want to start with those presuppositions today as we look at these stories. So jump into Luke chapter 7. And to understand Luke chapter 7, I want to invite you to open up to Luke chapter 4. Because we want to understand a little bit of context and ask, well, what is Jesus? What do we need to know about him? So Luke chapter 4 is the beginning of Jesus's, what we call his public ministry. When he proclaimed that he was God, that he was the Messiah, and that he was now, his mission had begun. And in Luke chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 18, we have Jesus in a synagogue in Nazareth, Nazareth, and he begins to proclaim something. He, he reads out of the book of Isaiah in chapter 61. Isaiah was a prophecy about the coming Messiah. So Jesus opens this up and begins reading Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and following, and applies it to himself. And he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So Jesus quotes this from Isaiah saying, hey, the Messiah will come and set the captives free and bring sight to the blind and these, perform these miracles and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's now my mission and it begins now. And then Jesus went on to say to the people in Nazareth, you hear this, and, and I am God in the flesh, but I know that you will reject me because you have a history of a prophet is not welcome in his own town. A man of God is often rejected in his hometown, so you might possibly do that for me. And then he went on to share two other stories, which we're not going to look at, but we'll only allude to. The two other stories from the Hebrew scriptures that would have been very familiar with the Jews in their synagogue. 
He mentioned two other stories that happened from other great prophets. Or uh, One was Elijah, who is known as the greatest prophet in uh, the Jewish history. And he says, remember the time when Elijah raised from the dead a widow's son. When God sent them, he performed this amazing miracle to get your attention as people, as a nation, yet you rejected him even after that miracle. And then Jesus said, or do you remember Elisha, another prophet who is known as one of the greatest? When God sent him and he actually healed the life of a foreign general, one of your enemies who was against Israel, actually God brought healing to him through Elisha. Trying to, again, get your attention as a nation. So Jesus says, I'm coming now as the Messiah, and I'm going to perform some signs and wonders because I want you to know who I am. But then Jesus says, but I recognize that you will likely reject a lot. Some of you are going to reject my teaching because you've done that throughout history. And he mentioned a couple of those great miracles I just mentioned. Now, keep that in mind. Now let's jump over to Luke chapter 7. Because that's how Jesus begins his ministry. He recognizes his mission. He says how he's going to go about it. He's, but he shows that sometimes the hearts of the people still reject in light of miracles. But now in Luke chapter 7, we get into two stories that are directly related to what he just proclaimed. So when we get to these, we ask the question, why did the author of this book, Luke, include these stories? It's because... He wanted to make a point. He wanted us to understand something about the character of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we'll understand today. So in Luke chapter 7, verse 1, it says, When he had completed all this discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. In other words, when Jesus just finished the sermon that we've been talking about the last month, where he talked about not... Uh, about loving your enemies and not judging those outside the church, but to allow God to be the judge and, and how to walk in, with one another and bear one another's burdens and sin and then how to build your life on the foundation of Jesus and nothing else. When he just finished that sermon, he now heads over to Capernaum. Verse 2, And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by that centurion was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, This man is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built the synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with him, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, don't even trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. So the story goes right now is Jesus is is in Capernaum and a centurion, which would be a Roman, essentially a captain in the Roman army. He's over at least 100 soldiers and he was kind of high up in his rank and usually generally hated by the people in Israel because they were an occupying force. But this one was liked. It said it was a Roman centurion. He had high regard for his servant. And and, and Roman centurions often were uh, single. It was part of their job. And so uh, their servants were included in part of their household. So he was someone he highly regarded who was sick and about to die. But in Capernaum, he was part of building the Jewish synagogue. Now, we don't know if that means that he was a convert to Judaism. It doesn't seem to indicate that. Or he was just a Roman person, a Gentile, who believed in God. Or he was just saying, hey, if I'm going to occupy these people, probably the, I can stay in their favor and make my life easier by helping out from time to time. We don't know. But he was highly regarded in the community of the Jewish community. So he asked some of the elders, say, hey, can you go to Jesus and ask if he could do something about my servant? So, and and notice what they say, Jesus, this guy is worthy. He deserves to be healed. How many of you have ever approached God in prayer with that kind of like, God, you know what? I've, I've, you could help me out here. I've been very faithful to you for a long time. You know, I, we, we, we don't really want to say it, but in our mind, we're like, we kind of are worthy of this, Lord. We're kind of worthy of you stepping in here. And on behalf of this centurion, the Jewish elders actually said that to Jesus. Now, if I was Jesus, I would think, well, this is a great teaching moment, isn't it? Where Jesus could say, well, the wages of sin is death. So what you're worthy of is death, actually, is what he could say. But he doesn't say that. Jesus just hears and he goes with them. He goes with them. 
Now, on his way, the centurion sends out another message and says, Jesus, don't even make, don't come the rest of the way. And interesting that he actually says, because I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. And maybe it had to do with saying, hey, you're a respected Jewish leader. If you come into my house, you're unclean. So I'm going to protect you from that. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. But even in that, he still says, so go ahead, help me out. (laughs) But I'm not worthy to even come. But say the word, Jesus. Say the word and I know it will be done. Because I'm, I, I'm a soldier in command. I understand authority. If I say something happens, it will happen. So Jesus, if you just say this will happen, my servant will be okay. That's in verse 8. I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. If I say go, he goes. And come, he comes. Do this and he does it. Now Jesus heard this and he marveled at it. And he turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even Israel have I found such great faith. Interesting that Jesus hears the response of the centurion who said, Jesus, I trust, I believe that you have the authority to do this. So you don't even have to come. And Jesus marvels at his faith. There's only two times in all of scripture that Jesus marvels at something according to uh, using this same word. And it's this time where he marvels at the faith of the non-Jew, and the other time is when he marveled at the lack of faith in the Jewish nation. And, and so here he marvels at this. He says, this is amazing. And this guy understands. He has such trust in my ability to have authority here. So then, verse 10, when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found that the slave was in good health. Jesus never actually goes to the centurion's house. He just says, this is amazing, and the save, slave was healed. Now, the first thing that we learn in this story when we're asked the question, who's that man? What do we know about Jesus? It's this idea of authority. We learn that Jesus here has authority. He has the ability to to make a change even over the things that are consequences of sin. See, if we go all the way back to the beginning, we find that God creates a world in perfect harmony where there's no pain, no sickness, no death, no spiritual separation from God. When sin enters into our equation, now we experience pain, death, heartache. All of those things are part of the human experience and separation from God. But Jesus here is demonstrating that even just temporarily here, for that man, he says, I'm going to show I have authority over the consequence of sin. I have authority over the effects of sin in this life. I can remove sickness if I need to. And when Jesus does this, it's a glimpse of eternity. See, he doesn't heal everybody right now. And I know some of you are here in this place and you say, Jesus, I sure would like a glimpse of eternity in my life. I would like for you to step in to remove my sickness, to remove my, my, my disease. I would like for you to come in and heal my marriage or repair my relationship with my kids. I would like for you to help me get a better job. Like, Jesus, can you just remove some of my consequence of sin and show your authority in my life? That's a question that we're going to wrestle with a little bit today. But in this case, Jesus is demonstrating he has authority over those things. In fact, just two chapters earlier, Jesus heals a paralyzed man. And when he healed him, he said, the guy came and they said, hey, this this guy's paralyzed. Let's heal him. And Jesus says, okay, I say your sins are forgiven. If you recall that story. Now, if I'm the paralyzed guy, I'm thinking, Jesus, that's not what I, that's not what I need right here. As, As you can see, I'm having trouble walk. Thank you for forgiving my sins, but let's deal with my walking first. But Jesus's response is, what is easier for me? To say your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk so that you may know I have the authority to forgive sins. In other words, I have the authority to remove the consequence of sin in our lives, the effects of sin. Jesus is demonstrating here or right here in this story. We're seeing the centurion understands that Jesus has authority. And the story's in here to remind us that though the world has fallen, Though we experience life and heartache and and, and pain and sometimes separation, it's reminding us that Jesus comes to take all of that away. Now, some of us will never experience that physical healing that we long for. Some of us will never see restoration in a relationship that we long for today. Some of us are going to wait for eternity, and, and that's painful, and I get it, and there isn't an easy answer for it. There isn't an easy answer for it. But today we're presented with, can we trust that Jesus has authority over those things? Now, we're going to keep going because there's a full story here. The story continues. 
And Luke does this very intentionally. So we keep going. He says, now soon after that, Jesus went into a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out. And the only son of his mother, she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from that city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and he said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearer came to a halt, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now that's a crazy story. <laughs> that's a crazy story. When we were preparing for this, uh, you know, last fall and, and kind of preparing, teaching through Luke, and I read that story, and I went, wait a minute, when did they add that? Because I've never read that story before. How did that get added in the newest edition of the Bible? It's just one of those that somehow I kept passing over. Now, Whatever you think about the miracle, this is just interesting because notice what he does. Jesus sees a widow and her only son had died. Now in her case, in, in their culture, the, if she was a widow, her son was the one who was responsible for her welfare. He would take care of her as she aged. He would provide for her through his work. He would take her into his home. So now think of her only lifeline has just died. So now she's a widow who would be left to the mercy of the community that she lives in. And Jesus sees her, and he has compassion on her, and so he heals her son. Now, notice how great faith she has in the story. Notice the amount of faith that she exercises. You see that, where it says about her faith? Yeah, it doesn't say about her faith, does it? We don't even know anything about her faith. In fact, I'm sure her faith grew after this, but before that moment, this has nothing to do with her. See, sometimes we think that God's work in our lives has everything to do with us. We think, God, you know, this is what I deserve. Look how great my faith is. Look how faithful I am. Look how much I tithe. Come on, Lord, help me out. This reminds us that sometimes the story, actually most often, the story is not actually about you. It's about our God. Notice what he says here. It says that he felt compassion on her. This is a great word. I don't always bring out the Greek words because sometimes it doesn't change the meaning. But this word for compassion is based on this root word called splachna. I like it because you kind of have to get your throat going on there. But it's splachna. Kind of say that with me. Splagna. Isn't that great? Now you know some Greek. Now this Greek actually is a good Greek word and it means intestines. Isn't that nice? You're learning useful things in church today. Come on, let's go. So, so but it's saying from the insides from his guts, he felt this pain for her. It's a very vivid feeling. It's not just that, well, I kind of feel sorry for her, but it's he breaks over this. Jesus, this is used of Jesus also in Matthew chapter 9 when he sees the crowds, and Jesus has splachna for the crowds because he says, they're all like sheep without a shepherd. And his heart broke, and he said, let's pray that God would send more workers of the harvest because my people are wandering and they need hope. So the heart of God, the compassion of God is poured out here, and Jesus sees her, and for some reason, he has this great compassion for her and decides to step in. Now, I know some of us, the question then that comes up is, why won't God have splagna on me and my pain? Why won't he step in and give me some compassion and heal my sick spouse? Why won't he step in and heal my child? And that answer is one of those answers I don't have for you today. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why sometimes his compassion moves him to bring actual relief, and sometimes he doesn't. I don't know why. Some of you might be saying, why doesn't he step in and remove the struggle with depression that I've had? I'm trying to be faithful. Why does he not have compassion on me? And all I can say is I believe through the whole of Scripture that Jesus does have compassion. We're commanded time and time again and instructed that he cares about you, and his heart breaks for you. He loves you. But sometimes that doesn't cause him to act in a way we want him to. And I don't know why. I don't know why. In Psalm chapter 41, or sorry, Psalm chapter 145, verse 8 and 9, I have it on the screen for you. It says this, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. Some days it doesn't feel that way, does it? But we can trust that, okay, God is compassionate. He feels for us. He, has, he loves us. And sometimes he may, that might cause him to act. Mike Erie once said this way, an author of Mike Erie, he says, God is always reliable. He's totally reliable. 
but he is never predictable. See, we can always rely on the character of God, but we can't always predict how he's going to, how that's going to cause him to act in our lives. I remember when I was growing up, two of my uncles died of tragic accidents, separate tragic accidents. And I remember when I was in eighth grade, when the second one died and my grandmother had just lost both of her sons, her only two sons. And I remember hearing her say, I'm done with God. I'm done. I just can't believe in a God that would do this to me. And it was about a week before she died, I had a conversation with her, and she said, I finally, I've made my peace with God. I'm ready to go now. And I don't think that my grandmother made it into heaven, and Jesus said, seriously, why did you doubt me those last 12 years? Seriously, why, why were you so angry and bitter? I think he had splagna, and his heart broke and said, if only you would have, because your life is just a blip in the rest of eternity, and that blip sometimes feels like eternity in your pain. But now I want to show you, my beloved daughter, what the rest of eternity will look like for you. And, and I'm okay with that anger and bitterness. I, I forgive it because I understand. I don't know the answer of why that happened, but he stepped in. Sometimes we don't get the answer we want. Uh, as this story goes on, right in, in chapter 7, the very next thing that happens, and I, this is very intentional, it says in verse 18, the disciples of John, this is John the Baptist, reported all these miracles to John. And summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord and said, and said, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? See, a little context, John the Baptist was proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. He's the son of God, that he will come and take away sickness and disease and healing and he will free our nation. That's what he proclaimed. But now John the Baptist, for context, is in prison. So he's in prison. He's been proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. And now he's hearing about these great miracles. And his question is, are you the one I've been waiting for? It seems like, John, did you just hear? A dead guy just got raised. And John's like, so are you the son of God or not? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm like, okay, I'm in. But notice something here. Uh, Jesus responds to John. And he says, oh, well, go send this report to John. He says it in verse 22. Go and report to John what you've seen and what you've heard. The blind receive sight. The lame can walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf can hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the good news preached to them. That's awesome. But if you remember back to chapter 4, Jesus left out one little line when he reported to John. One little line was, and the prisoners have been set free. He told John, hey, I am the Messiah. I am doing all these great things. I am stepping in. I am bringing healing. And John's like, and prisoners are set free, right? And Jesus, in a way, was saying, and yes, I am God. And no, you're not getting out. You're not going to hear what you want to hear, John. Seriously, John the Baptist is somebody worthy for God's intervention? It's a guy like that. But Jesus says, yeah, so I'm the one you're waiting for. I can do all those great things, and I'm not going to do it for you. In fact, the story goes, I don't know, a week, a month later, John was beheaded and killed for his faith. <laughs> okay? Who wants to become a Christian today? This sounds great. Sign me up. Yeah, sometimes Jesus says the answer is yes, I am who you expected. You can trust me and know you're not getting what you want. But that doesn't change who I am because God has a bigger plan sometimes that we don't get. And I wish, I wish in the back of the Bible, you could just say, okay, depression, what's the answer? Oh, the reason I struggle with depression is because there is no appendix that tells you why. I don't know why. And it's not a, it's not a time to try to... Tell someone, I mean, sometimes when you're in that great pain, you don't need to hear, but God's good. You're like, yeah, I know, but it hurts right now. Maybe you just need to hear, God understands, and I don't know why. So John doesn't get the answer he wants. You might not get the answer you want. I wish I could answer it. There is no answer sometimes. So as we continue to look at this, though, I want to step a little bit back to John uh, it's still in Luke chapter 7. Now, the end of the story, I skipped over a couple of verses. Right after Jesus raises this dead man, 
Verse 16, fear gripped all of them. That's an appropriate response, wouldn't it be? Like, oh, okay. Some of your translations have awe. I like that one too. It really means the fear of God. The idea that, wow, something big is happening here. And they all began glorifying God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God is visiting his people. God is here in flesh. And this report concerning Jesus went out all over Judea in the surrounding district. See, the last word that we have for today is the word glory. Glory means it's the reflection, it's the character and likeness of God. And so people left glorifying God. They began telling about his character, telling about his likeness. God stepped in and his story was now made known. Now, in this story, it was a good thing, right? How would you like to be that mother? My son died, Jesus rose him to the dead. I will tell everybody, right? You would be telling everybody. But what about the stories that don't end the right way? Stephen was one of the disciples in the book of Acts. And he was proclaiming, the ways of Jesus, and he was killed for his faith. They killed him by stoning him to death, throwing stones and killing him. While he was dying, he prayed this prayer, Jesus, forgive them, for they do not understand what they're doing. And then he died. He didn't pray, God, you know, can you make these stones, like, not work? Bounce off me, feel like Nerf bullets? I don't know. His prayer was, forgive them. And he died. His story didn't end the way we'd kind of think the story should end. See, if he got stoned to death and he popped up and said, sorry, Jesus isn't me. You can't kill me. That would glorify God, right? You'd say, wow, your God's pretty powerful. But he died. And that glorified God. Because they said, what is it that you can go through such great pain and tragedy and yet still trust? and still believe. What is it with this God that will change your life that much that you can face the storms and yet still have faith? That lifts up the name of God. And so our stories don't always end the way we want them to. But the point of these stories is it points us back to the character and likeness of Jesus and who he is. And through our lives, when things go the way we want them to and when things don't, it can point others to the greatness of our God. As last week we looked at, our lives can be built upon the foundation of Christ, not so that storms never hit us, but when storms hit you, you still have something your life is anchored in. So as we end here today, we're going to do something in a few minutes. We're going to end and celebrate with baptisms. But before we even get to that, I just had the sense as I was preparing and praying for today that for some of you in this place, this will resonate. Some of you are here, and it's a hard place today. In fact, Mother's Day alone, for some of you, is a tough day. Maybe it's your first day, the first Mother's Day without your mother. Or maybe every year it reminds you of a son or a daughter that you lost. Maybe it reminds you of a pain in a relationship with your parents or with your kids. Maybe you're here and you say, I've longed to be a mother my whole life, but I never met the right person. Or that I did meet the right person, and then we struggle with infertility. And so God doesn't always seem fair, and a day like this can remind you of that. Maybe you're here today, and these stories make you just say, Jesus, I was sure would love your healing. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to end our time. I'm going to invite the worship team to make their way up. And before we transition into baptisms, I want to ask something of you in this place. And if today has resonated with someone in here, and and I don't know who or what that means, but in just a moment, if you are saying like, I I just need someone to pray for me today, and maybe it's prayer because you've been wrestling with doubt. Maybe you you want prayer to say, I would love for God to heal me. Maybe you need prayer because you need God to show up in your life. I don't know what it is, but in just a moment, if that's you, if you say, I I would love the church to pray for me, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. And and I know right away, some of you were like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, wait, no, I'm not in anymore. (laughs) No one here is going to judge you for standing up. No one's going to say, oh, I wonder what that person's issue is. Oh, let me look at them. Oh, I figured it out. (laughs) We're a church. We're a family. We want to experience the grace of Jesus together and the passion of God with one another. So 
Uh, we, we did this in the first service, and we'll do this in this one. So if that's you this morning, you, and, and you don't, you're not going to have to explain your story, but if you just say, hey, I would, love, I would love for someone to pray for me right now, would you just stand where you are? Just stand where you are, and in a moment, we're going to pray for you. I know it takes great courage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. And, and just stay standing, and, and we're going to do something here now as... And if, if you feel like standing at any point, just, just get up. And what we're going to do in just a moment is the people around you, I'm going to ask the church to look around, find someone who's standing, and just circle around them or reach out to them, and just a couple of you pray. And even that's awkward. I get it. But we're a family. And so I'm going to ask those who are part of Seacoast, uh, if the, it, if you're a part of Seacoast or not, if you are a follower of Jesus today, let's pray for our brothers and sisters here who are standing. And you don't even need to know their story. I just want you to pray for them. And um, so we're going to do that, and then we'll sing. So just gather around, just circle around if there's someone standing near you. And I want to make sure everyone has some people standing around them. So let's go ahead, and if you have to move, please move. And let's find someone who, who we can stand around and pray for. I think there's a couple in the back behind. There you go. I think we got them there. Cool. And just start praying, and it'll be a little noisy and messy, and that's okay, so just start praying. And in a moment, I'll join in and pray, but I want you to continue to pray here. And the rest of us, let's just bow our heads and, and just pray that God would move. And, and, and keep praying where you are. Just don't, let, don't worry about me. I want you to keep praying for those individuals, and I'm going to pray, Lord, we pray that you would meet us in this place. Lord, we trust that you have authority over all things in our lives. And we trust that you are a God of compassion who looks at us and your heart breaks. And so this morning, we ask for everyone in here that you, we would sense your presence, that we would sense your goodness. And God, even in our doubts and our weakness, Lord, would you step in now in this place? Amen.